Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading 1 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 7, and this is what it says. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. But to me it is a very small thing that I should be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I did not even examine myself. I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. But the one who examines me is the Lord. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before time, but wait until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that in us you might learn not to exceed what is written, in order that no one of you might become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. For who regards you as superior? And what do you have that you did not receive? But if you did not receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Pray with me. Lord, this day is yours. Thank you for taking part in it. And use, use this day to transform us, to make us more like you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Read a story about a woman who went to her pastor. Said, Pastor, will you help me? The pastor said, well, of course. What can I do? She said, well, my father... He's won $300 million in the lottery, and he's 96 years old. Well, the pastor said, I don't understand. How can I help there? She said, well, I'm afraid if I tell him that he's won $300 million, he'll have a heart attack. So I'd like for you to go tell him. <laughs> well, that's, the pastor didn't really appreciate being put in that position, but he told her that he would help. So he said, okay. He went over to the old man's house, and he thought he'd break it in slowly. And maybe start talking about the weather. So he asked the old man, he said, well, how about the weather these days? And the old man said, yeah, the weather's a lot like it is in the winter around here. It's shiny one day and it's cold the next and it rains pretty much all the time. Well, they kind of giggled about that. and Said, yeah, that's true. He said, well, did you see the Super Bowl last weekend? And the, the old man said, I sure did. Watched every minute of it. I had the best seat in the house. The pastor said, you mean you went to the game? He said, no, I had the best seat in the ha house. I had your chair that you're sitting in right now. That's my chair. I was watching TV from that chair right there. Well, they kind of giggled about that, and then they moved on. The pastor thought, well, maybe this is the time. I'll, I'll, I'll broach the subject slowly. So he asked the old man, he said, did you hear that the lottery's up to $300 million now? The old man said, yes, I heard that. He said, what do you think you'd do if you won $300 million? The old man said, well, you know, I'm 96 years old, and if I won $300 million, I'd still be 96 years old, so that wouldn't change. And I have arthritis now. If I won $300 million, I'd still have arthritis. That wouldn't change. He said, so 
If I won $300 million, I, I think I'd probably just give it all to the church. That's when the pastor had a heart attack. <laughs> well, what I like about this story is, is it goes one direction before you know, it changes directions. And it, it, it changes directions immediately. It changed directions on a dime. Well, that's what's happening in the, this letter to, to the church in Corinth. 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians are written to a church in, that, was, that Paul started in a city. A city that was established by the Roman government. It was established kind of as the, the edge of, of civilization. It was for army grunts. It was for misfits. It was for refugees. It was for the undesirables. And, and, and there on the edge of civilization, they were the tough people who could tough it out. It was sort of like Dodge City is what it was like. Well, when Paul started a, a church there, it started small, but as it began to grow, some of those wild, some of that Wild West culture began to flood into the church. And, and you read First and Second Corinthians, and you, you read about things going on in the church. That you, how could anybody think that that's right? I mean, they would come to church drunk. Who comes to church drunk? But that's what they do. Who comes to church drunk? That's a rhetorical question. I'm not asking for a show of hands. I, people were doing just things that were just so far outside the pale. And you would think that Paul would just read the riot act to him from beginning of his letter to the end of it. But that's not what he does. Now, he, he doesn't close his eyes and ignore what they're doing. But instead, he starts with their identity. Who they are. Not with how they're acting. He starts with who they are. And in chapter 1, he calls them saints, called of God, that they're called to be holy and set apart. That's what a saint is. It's not somebody who's dead. It's somebody holy and set apart. And then in chapter 1, he talks to them about their bickering, that they go ahead and they start arguing with each, each other. You know, well, I'm called of, of Paul, and I'm called of Apollos, and I'm called of Cephas, Cephas and they're, they're, they they kind of try and set a pecking order in order to fight it out among each other. Well, Paul has none of that at all. Know who you are. Know your identity as a, as a saint called of God. You're set aside holy and not this bickering. And then in chapter 2, he begins to talk about the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the risen Christ that lives in them. And in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 12, it says, Now you have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that you might know the things freely given to us by God. That there's been a power and a strength that the risen Christ gives to, to not only those in Corinth, but you and me. And Paul wants to make sure that they know their identity first. And in chapter 3, he goes on to, to talk about it, and, and we're fitted together, pulled together as a temple. In 1 Corinthians 3, 16, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? That your body is a holy place. Set aside. Not meant as a playground, but as a holy place. And then now in chapter 4, he offers a Another way to talk about that, that gift, that Spirit of God that is in them. So they might know their identity in Jesus Christ. And here in verse 1 it says, your, your servants and stewards are the mysteries. Two things. Servants and stewards are the mysteries of God. That's what he says in verse 1. And to be quite frank with you, the image of being a, a servant and a steward, it kind of leaves me cold. I mean... I think of a servant as somebody who walks around with a tray of finger sandwiches and, and drinks, trying to give finger sandwiches and drinks to folks. And that, that doesn't just warm my heart, so to speak. Of, you know, we're called to be somebody who walks around with a tray of finger sandwiches and drinks. So I, I, I looked at that word, and, and in Greek, I found out that that word is huperitas. And huperitas is not somebody who goes around giving finger san sandwiches. Huperitas is something quite specific. It's an oarsman, not an oarsman in a rowboat, someone who, who goes around and just rows themselves. It's an oarsman that, that, that 
carries the oar on the bottom floor of a trireme ship. There are hundreds of oarsmen on a trireme ship, and it's there on the bottom floor that they're least likely to know the destination of the ship. It's on the bottom floor of that trireme ship that they're least likely to know the dangers of that ship. That it's on the bottom floor of a trireme ship that, that it's required that they look to the pilot and trust the pilot and be servants to what the pilot wants. Shoulder to shoulder, side by side, pulling together, not their own rowboat, but all together, that they're, 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 they're pulling together and going in the same direction to serve what it is that the, the, the pilot, who's most likely to know the dangers and the destination, that they're all to keep their eyes and trust the pilot. Well, that's what the servant is. But the steward, well, to be quite frank with you, I, the only place that we hear stewards nowadays is on cruise boats. And I don't really know what a steward does on a cruise boat. So I began to look at that word too. And the word in Greek is oikonomos. It's where we get our word economy from. It's two Greek words put together. And the, the oikonomos is the one who, oiko means house, and nomos is rules or law. And the oikonomos is the one who knows the house rules. It's the manager. He's not the one that owns the house. He's not the one that owns the farm. He's not the master of, of the, the farm, of the property that the family has been put in his trust. He's, we might think of the word manager. He, it's, it's the farm that's been put in his care. It's the security of the house, the farm, the family that is his responsibility. And so what it's saying here is, is, is not only are we to trust like we trust the pilot, but we're trusted as the manager, the trusted manager that has the responsibility of the family, of the house, of the farm given to us, and that we're, we're trusted. So we're to trust and we're trusted. Trust and trusted. It's not often that we think of the Christian life in, in that way. A lot of times we think it was just to have faith, to, to trust God. Well, that's a huge part of it, but we're also trusted, trusted by God. And that's what I want to talk about this morning, trust and trusted. Well, it says right here we're trust and trusted with the mysteries of God. Well, what are the mysteries of God? Well, in verse 7, it hints at it. It says, what do you have that you have not received? They're the gifts of God. It's what he's been talking about with the Holy Spirit. They're the gifts that, that God's Spirit, the risen Christ, gives to, to you and to me. And the first thing that I want to talk about is we're trusted. We're to trust, and we're trusted with the unconditional love of God. That's the first thing I want to talk about, God's unconditional love. I have a good friend named Bob. We went to four-year-old kindergarten together. We hit it off in four-year-old kindergarten, and we stayed good friends all the way through kindergarten, elementary school, middle school. We played sports together. High school, we played sports together. And after high school and college, we'd get jobs together. So we could spend the weekends together, do things together. And uh, Bob has a story about when he was in first grade about uh, the teacher was wanting to get to know the students better. So she would go around, and she'd ask each of the kids, what does your father do for a living? Well, the first kid said, my dad works for Lockheed. And the second kid said, well, my dad works for Lockheed. Well, it was Marietta. And at that time, every kid's dad just about worked for Lockheed and got to Bob and said, what does your father do? And he said, my father sleeps. Well, the teacher thought that was pretty funny. He said, certainly your father does something more than just sleeps. Bob said, no, my dad sleeps. That's what he does. Well, the teacher thought that was pretty funny. So when Bob's mother came to pick him up at the end of the day, the teacher said, I was asking Bob what his father did. And Bob said his father sleeps. Well, Bob's mom didn't think it was near as funny as the teacher did. She said, yes, 
my husband has three jobs, and he goes to night school at night. So when Bob sees him, he's sleeping. <laughs> well, from the point of view of a, of, a, of, of a first grader, that makes sense. His dad sleeps. But it's a very limited point of view. We're in a hard time right now. And we have a very limited point of view. And in the middle of hardship, in the middle of crisis, in the middle of this pandemic, it's easy to cry out, where is God and what's he doing? Where is he? Is he asleep? That's why Jesus came. Jesus Christ came so we would know where God is and what's he doing. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says, Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his nature. That we know the nature of God by looking to Jesus, by reading the Gospels. And in, in looking to the Gospels, in looking to Jesus, we can see that wherever there's heartache, Jesus is there. Wherever there's suffering, Jesus is there. Wherever there's brokenness, Jesus is there. Where there's celebration, Jesus is in the middle of that too. That God has not left us alone. That we're, look, we're to look to Jesus, to look to him as the pilot, to trust that he knows the destination, he knows the dangers. But we, we wrestle with our emotions in the middle of all this. That's what faith does. That on one side we have the faith and, and what we know from Scripture, but on the other side we have these emotions that, that call us to, to panic. It's like being taught to swim as a child. The instructor tells you that not only is she going to teach you to swim, but to, to, to float on your back. And you can look in the pool and you can see that, the, that, that, that people are able to float on their back and, 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 and breathe while floating on their back. And you look at it, you see it, you believe it. But the minute that you try it, that's when panic sets in. And when the panic sets in, you begin to, to thrash around and sink, and that's when you have to, to trust, to trust that the instructor's there to, to hold you up, to help you practice until you fight those emotions. That you and I are to look to the pilot to trust, to practice by opening up Scripture, by practice in worship, by practice in prayer. To look and to trust him. But we're also trusted that side by side, shoulder to shoulder, working together with the other oarsmen, we encourage that we build up. That we give that message that you're not alone, that you matter to God. That there's a, the reason Jesus came is to show you his unconditional love. That you and I, we're trusted with that message. To trust and trusted with the mysteries of God. And that mystery is, well, it's unconditional love. But the second mystery I want to talk about is unmerited grace. James Moore tells a story about Nurse Sue Kidd. She was a nurse in a large downtown hospital. One of her patients was Mr. Williams. She was an ICU nurse, and Mr. Williams had had a heart attack. He had had a tough time of it, and while she was there taking his vital signs, Mr. Williams asked Nurse Kidd, does my daughter Janie know that I'm here in ICU? She's my only family member. Well, Nurse Kidd said, well, you haven't had any visitors, so I don't think sh that she does. That's when Mr. Williams said, I could I trouble you? To, I can give you her phone number. Could you call my daughter Janie and let her know that, that I'm here in the hospital? Well, she took out her pad, and, and Mr. Williams began to give Janie's phone number. And that's when Mr. Williams said, and could I trouble you also for a piece of paper from your pad? She said, certainly. So she gave him a piece of paper. And this kid went to, to see the other patients there in ICU, and and then she went to call Janie. And when Janie answered the phone and Nurse Kidd told her that her father was in ICU, 
She burst into tears. She said, tell me he's going to be okay. Please tell me he's going to be okay. And then without asking, she volunteered this story. She said that she and her father had gotten into a terrible argument over a year before. It was over a boy and that Janie had blurted out that she hated her father and that she hadn't talked to him in over a year. Janie went on to say, please tell me he's going to be okay. Well, nurse kid said, well, he's, he's got a long road to go, and together we're working as hard as we can, but if you want to see him, you need to come to see him now. Well, nurse kid went back to her rounds, and while she was in the room with Mr. Williams, he had another heart attack. She was right there with him. She called the, the team. They tried to, to revive him, but they couldn't, and Mr. Williams died right then. Shortly afterwards, Janie came to the ICU. Nurse Kidd met her outside the doors and told her that her father had passed. And that's when Janie said, could I come see him? Nurse Kidd led Janie back to her father's room. She fell on her father and she began to weep and cry. She said, I I love you, Daddy. I don't hate you. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I really love you. That's when Nurse Kid noticed that, that clutched in Mr. Williams' hand was that piece of paper that she had given him. She took the piece of paper out of his, his hand, and, and at the top it said, Dear Janie. She handed the note, said, Janie, this note is for you. And there on the note, her father had written, Dear Janie, I'm sorry about that night. I love you, and I know that you love me, and I know... You don't hate me. All is forgiven. All is forgiven. All is forgiven. Before Janie called out, before Janie confessed, her father said, all is forgiven. And that's what Jesus did on the cross for you and for me. He pronounced, all is forgiven. Before, before we cried out, before we confessed, before we did a thing, That on the cross, Jesus wiped away all that sin, the shame, the fear, the worry, all those things that would destroy us. That on the cross, he took it on himself and he nailed it to kill it once and for all. And he gave that forgiveness to you and to me. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He forgave it long ago, but very often we don't, most often we don't receive that forgiveness until we confess it. And then he doesn't just pardon it and say, okay, and live with the mess you made. No, it says, and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That the risen Christ has a power you and I don't have to cleanse to make us new, to give us a rebirth, a start over, that all is forgiven. And to trust, to look to the pilot, to trust Jesus is to trust that what he did on the cross was enough to wipe away all the sins and to cleanse us. And that we're trusted, trusted with that forgiveness. Trusted to, that side by side, shoulder to shoulder, to lift up those around us, to encourage and to get that message out to a world that needs to know all is forgiven. It's, 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 it's an unmerited grace. It's a mystery that, that we don't deserve, that we haven't earned. To trust and to be trusted. It's that mystery, that mystery that Jesus Christ has given to you and to me. Not only is it unmerited grace and unconditional love, but the last thing that I want to talk about this morning is is his unending hope. His unending hope. Back in 1988, the world had one of the most devastating earthquakes ever. It was in Armenia. It's estimated 30,000 people died in that earthquake in 1988. One of the stories that comes from that earthquake, that there was an elementary school that was reduced to rubble. 
And one of the fathers ran to that elementary school and began to dig in the rubble. And other parents did too. And as they they dug in the rubble, for eight hours they dug in the rubble, never hearing a voice. And others would come and say, you need to stop. No one could survive that. 16 hours later, and there was this father digging in the rubble. 32 hours later, still he didn't stop. And in the 38th hour after, after the collapse of that building, the father heard a voice. And he shouted down through the hole there in the rubble, can you hear me? And back came a voice, Dad, it's me, Aaron. I told the other kids not to worry, that you were alive and you would save me. And when you saved me, they would be saved too. Our Savior, His name is Jesus. And he never stops searching. He never stops seeking. He never stops digging for you and for me. No matter what the situation, no matter the pandemic, no matter what we're covered up with, no matter how our emotions are responding, that we're to look to him, we're to trust that he's never going to stop looking, that he is our eternal hope. Romans chapter 15 verse 13 says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the power that His Spirit has given to you and to me. Hope. Hope. A hope and, and, and that, that, that He's there. He's searching. He's seeking. That we're not alone. And that hope might be real and alive in us. Not only are we to trust, but we're trusted with that hope. That shoulder to shoulder, side by side, oarsman to oarsman, we're to encourage. We're to build up and to carry on that message of hope that this world needs to hear. This morning... It may be that in faith that you're struggling with that, those emotions to trust, to trust Jesus. That panic has set in and that you need to know the power of His Spirit for that unending trust. Or maybe it's the power of His Spirit for that, for that everlasting grace or His unconditional love. It's available to you today. And I want you to pray with me. Join with me in prayer. Jesus, it's the power, the power of Your Holy Spirit that that we desire in our lives because our emotions, they're... Our emotions are denying what we say we believe. We say we do believe, that we do trust you, but instead our emotions are causing us to panic. And rather than responding in hope and trust of you, we listen to these voices in the world telling us to be afraid, be very afraid. Breathe the power of your Spirit, your unending hope on us this day. Lord, It's that unmerited grace that sometimes, yes, we say we believe that you forgive us, but the panic sets in. And we remember something that happened a long time ago. Something that you cast as far as the east is from the west, and we bring it up to mind, and and we're shaken. That unmerited grace. Lord, Grant us strength and power enough to look to you as the pilot, to trust in that unmerited grace. And and Lord, know that we're trusted to encourage those around us to lift up and give out that message of unmerited grace. Lord, it may be that all we've experienced here in this world is a conditional love. It may be by those around us. And so too often we respond with a, Emotional panic, thinking 
That's the only kind of love there is, a conditional love. And we need the power of your Spirit to trust in, in you that we're not alone, that you're not asleep, that you're right here with us. Lord, grant us that power that we trust you and that we're trusted by you to lift up, to encourage, and to get out that message, that message of unconditional love to a world that needs to know that they're not alone. Breathe that strength on us now. That this day we might celebrate in you and be made brand new. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online, my hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us. <music>